Good to see you. All right. All right. Good evening. How is everybody? Good, 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 good. It's so good to see you tonight. We are uh, in our study of the uh, covenants, and we are in the Mosaic Covenant. We really want to take some time tonight to really dig this out and understand this covenant and to uh, learn a little bit more about what God has in mind for us outside of some of the concepts that maybe we think we understand about the Mosaic Covenant. So we'll get that going. Let's pray, all right? Father, thank you for uh, the day that you've given us. Lord, I know that rains are coming soon. We want to thank you for the rain. We pray, Lord, that you would protect us if there are winds and hail and things of that nature. We uh, just entrust ourselves to you, and it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. All right, we are in uh, a study of the uh, Mosaic Covenant, all right? Now, the Mosaic Covenant uh, is uh, probably the, the more familiar covenant uh, in, uh, in the Bible, uh, it lasted for about 1,500 years. God gives it to uh, Israel through uh, Moses, and uh, it is the governing covenant, primary gov- gov- governing covenant with uh, the people of Israel uh, up till uh, the seed of Abraham comes. What do I mean by that? Yeah, until Jesus came, right? Okay. Uh, if you'll go to the book of Galatians, which is a great place to start as we talk about uh, the Mosaic Covenant, Paul really gives us some, uh, some insight here. Uh, in, the, uh, in the book of Galatians chapter 4, all right? Galatians chapter 4, Paul helps us understand the, uh, the terms of uh, the Mosaic Covenant and how uh, God operated with Israel through that until Christ came. Galatians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, it says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of the woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption uh, of sons. Uh, In this, Paul gives us uh, a little bit of uh, insight into the Abrahamic covenant as well as the the Mosaic covenant, and he kind of runs those uh, parallel because they do run parallel. Matter of fact, uh, if we can look... um, Let's see, let's go to, let's see, Uh, go to, um, go to verse 17 of chapter 3. He's talking about the Abrahamic covenant and the law and how they run parallel together. Basically, what I I want to say about that is, God gave the Abrahamic covenant first, and it's a covenant of blessing, all right? Uh, Then, uh, several hundred years later, he gives the Mosaic covenant, and they're running parallel uh, to to one another. Notice what uh, he says in chapter 3, verse 17, and this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. And so what, he, what he's saying here is that there's the Abrahamic covenant, which is a covenant of promise. And that part of that covenant of promise is that God was going to send the Messiah, that God was going to send Christ to not just Abraham and, and his descendants, but ultimately to the world right? And so he says that's going along, and then God brings in the Mosaic Covenant. He says the Mosaic Covenant did not disannul the uh, Abrahamic Covenant. Normally, whenever we have a covenant or a will, let's use that terminology, if you have a will, how many of you have wills? All right, if you have a will, and your will is dated March 7th, uh, 2001, okay? 
And let's say that today you went back to the attorney and, and you bring up uh, uh, new terms uh, of the will and you bring in this new will, right? And so it's dated today. How does that affect this will? It's, dis- it, it, it's, it's, it's annulled, right? It's no longer valid because now we put this will in, into place. A lot of times people think, well, because the Mosaic Law came in, then the promise was done away with. The promise wasn't done away with. The reason the promise was not done away with, and we looked at this last week, is it was confirmed by an oath. And you remember we talked about that, how God swore that he would honor this promise to Abraham, no matter what, he would honor that, right? And we talked about how God swore, and, and we talked about in our culture today, whenever we make an oath or we swear, we do it by a higher power. And normally in our culture, because of our Judeo-Christian heritage, what do we normally swear upon? The Bible, a higher authority, and we swear to God, a higher authority, right? Well, the question begs, and we talked about this last week, Hebrews talks about this. If God is going to make an oath, then who's he going to swear upon? There's no higher authority than him, so it says that God swore to himself, right? That he would honor this promise. So Paul talks about that, or the writer of Hebrews talks about that a little bit later. But he says, this covenant, even though the Mosaic covenant was confirmed, it did not, uh, it didn't do away with the Abrahamic covenant, the running parallel. Now, we got to understand in part what, what this covenant, this Mosaic covenant's purpose was. And it's twofold. Number one, it put Israel on probation. What do I mean that it put Israel on probation? Right. Right, it was, it, I'll do this if you do this, and I'll do this if you don't do this, right? Uh, the summary of that, the book of Exodus gives us the giving of the law, right? Exodus chapter 20, and then subsequent chapters. So, in Exodus, we meet Israel at Mount Sinai, okay? And it's only a few weeks, relatively speaking, it's only a few weeks after they've left Egyptian bondage, right? Right? They've been slaves for for over 400 years. Now they're liberated, and they become a nation once they ratify their constitution with God. The Mosaic Covenant is a constitution. It's the agreement that they have with their God, and it's agreement that they have with one another. Okay? And so only a few weeks after witnessing ten miracles. We don't normally call them miracles. We usually call them what? plagues, right? It depends on what side of the fence you're on. If you're on the Jewish side of the fence, or at that time Israel, they're not Jews at that time, it's, they're, they're Israelites uh, and Hebrews, uh, but for them, that was, these were miracles. For the Egyptians who were suffering, they didn't call them miracles, they called them plagues. So it depends on what side of the fence you're on, okay? But whether we call them 10 miracles or 10 plagues, it's only a few weeks after they have witnessed this that they receive the covenant uh, with God. After receiving the covenant with God, from the time that they receive it at Mount Sinai until they begin their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, there are 10 occasions. Interesting, isn't it? There's 10 miracles that they see, but there are 10 occasions between the giving of the law and then their punishment to wander in the wilderness, where they demonstrate unbelief toward God. Ten different occasions. The tragedy of it is, what had they seen? They had seen ten, ten miracles. But they demonstrate their unbelief. Why? Well, the Bible tells us in the book of Deuteronomy that that generation, it says of this, that they were a perverse, crooked, and forward generation. The Bible says that in them there was no faith. This is what God says through Moses to them. This is mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 32. So you have some history of Israel in the book of Exodus from chapter 20, receiving the law, and more law is given. 
And then you go in from Exodus to what book? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Okay, now what is the book of Leviticus about? Okay, it's laws. It, it, it is details of the Mosaic Covenant. Don't think that the Mosaic Covenant is just ten commandments. There's over 600 commandments to them. And as we mentioned before in different studies, it covers every aspect of their life. Okay, let me uh, give you this uh, very quickly. The, the words of the covenant, the Mosaic Covenant contains more words than any other covenant given in Old Testament times. Numerous chapters are given to record the words of this covenant. Listen to this. If you're taking notes, I'll try not to be too, quickly, too quick in this. The words of the covenant are found in Exodus 20 through chapter 40. They're found in Leviticus chapters 1 through 27. They're found in Numbers 1 through 10, chapter 15, chapter 18, chapter 19, chapter 28, chapter 29, and chapters 30 through 36. That's a lot of words, right? And then in the book of Deuteronomy, chapters 1 through 34, okay? And what God does there is, in all of this, God classifies three major divisions of the law. There was his moral law. Now, this consisted of the Ten Commandments written on two tablets of stones. They're called specifically his covenant and the Ten Words. So this is the moral law of God. It's important for us to understand that. The moral law of God comes out of God's character. If you want to know God's character, you can look at the Ten Commandments because it gives us his moral character, okay? Now, in that... Those laws are good for any society. Thou shalt not kill. Is that good for any society? Sure it is. Thou shalt not steal. Is that good for any society? Yes, because it comes out of the moral character of God, so it's good for any group of people. But remember, it was given to whom? It was given to the Israelites, okay? This is the covenant between God and Israel. It's not between you and Israel or God and you, okay? Even though these are moral laws, these, all of these things are directed to the nation of Israel. Where they cooperate with us goes back to what we had a lesson several months ago uh, in all, but God is putting his law in our hearts. That's Jew and Gentile. Every person has the law of God, the moral law of God written in our hearts. We call it natural law. Our founding fathers, when they were trying to put together documents for a covenant, when they were putting words together for a will or testimony, uh, when they were putting words together for a constitution, they studied, among other things, natural law. And based upon the fact there was natural law, it only became evident that certain things were true. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Well, what truths? Right, that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain rights, and among those rights are life, liberty, and the Pursuit of happiness. They say these things are self-evident. Well, how are they self-evident? God has written them in your hearts. The, the, the U.S. government doesn't give you these rights. Congress doesn't give you these rights. These rights have been given to you by your Creator. Right? And it's important for us to understand that even though the moral law and the ceremonial law and the social law or the civil law was given to the nation of Israel, there are certain things that we can take out of these laws because they are confirmed in our hearts when we are made. And it goes back to that whole issue. Uh, how do we know that we shouldn't kill? Well, natural law tells me my life is valuable. We fight to live, don't we? We fight to live. If you threaten me, I'm going to fight you, right? If I'm sick and go into the hospital, what am I going to do? I'm going to fight to live, 
right? So natural law says my life has value because it's a gift from God. Then natural law says, well, if my life is valuable and you're created by the same God, your life is valuable. So if my life is valuable, and your 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 life is valuable, then as a culture, what should we do? Promote life. Everything we do as a society should what? Promote life, because life is a gift of God. It is self-evident. That's why in 1973, when we gave the right for abortion, it changed the soul of America. And you say, how in the world did we get there? Well, first of all, we had to do away with what? Justices who believed in natural law. We began to go based upon reason. And it's only reasonable that if it's a woman's body... And if she chooses to get pregnant and doesn't want the baby, then we provide an alternative. But that's against what? Natural law. And what happens to the soul of America? We're dying. We're dying. That's why we have to be careful about unprovoked war. Yes, we have military power. Okay, But just because we have military power doesn't mean we need to abuse that power. And I'm not suggesting that we have, although I would say that there have been some occasions where it is suspect. But if we have no value for life, and this is probably more in tune with some things back in the 60s, if we have no value of life, then we can send Greg to Vietnam. And if Greg gets killed, you know, and I, I don't want to get into this big debate about it. It's not my purpose of doing that. But, you know, why, why are we there? You know, men like Greg and other men, but men like Greg and my, my, my brother and, and Shannon's dad, they went out of a sense of loyalty to the country. The authority told them that you need to go. But I still wonder, why? Yeah, yeah, I know. I talked to my brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, why, why are we here? What, what are we doing? And, and then the, the nation's in confusion, right? The nation's in, in confusion. So anyway, I don't even know how we, again, got there. But, but you have the moral law of God, and then you have another division, the civil law of God. The civil law of God is this. This multiplied a variety of regulations, and they simply amplified the basic principles of moral law. These are primarily found in Exodus 21 through 23. The application of these laws governed every area of Israel's life, how they interacted civilly, socially, economically, personally, and legally. And the thing you have to remember is, Israel was a theocracy. How many theocracies have there been? Right, yeah, one. Right, it was the only theocracy. What do we mean by theocracy? God is the king, right? Right. Exactly, we want another king. And then what did God tell Samuel? Samuel comes and says, hey, they want a king. What did did God say? Well, give them what they want. Be sure to tell them, though, up front. It's not going to be what you think it is. You get a king, he'll send your sons into battle, he'll tax everything that you own, but if that's what you want, you can have it. I mean, I don't tax you, and if I send your kids into battle, I'm going to protect them, but if you don't want that... You know, and he says, you can almost hear a broken heart in that because God says to Samuel, Samuel, they've not rejected you, they've rejected me. All right. And so, civil law. Can you give me an example of some of the civil law? Okay, yeah. If you, thou shalt not commit adultery. What if you commit adultery? What were the consequences? Yeah. But, in that... In, 
Yeah, but in that situation, they drug you and the uh, uh, cooperating party out, and they stoned you to death. That's pretty severe. But it was the nature of it, all right? What if you killed somebody? Yeah, what you had to do, though, is you had to go to the elders, which was the, the court system. You went to the elders, and they determined whether it was what? An accidental death or whether it was murder. Yeah, they had cities of refuge. There were 48 cities throughout the land of Israel that somebody who was accused of, of the murder or the killing, I should say, the killing of somebody could flee to those cities and have their trial heard. Yeah, they get their day in court, and if it was determined, no, this was accidental. An illustration of that, you and I are out in the woods, and we're chopping down a tree, and the axe head flies off, and it hits you in the head and kills you. Well, your family's not going to be happy about that, so I flee to the city of refuge to watch, share my case. This is what happened. I was chopping down that tree, and the head of it came off, and it killed him. I didn't, I didn't mean to kill him. Well, that's different than if I, yeah. If I, yeah, if I take the axe and hit you upside the head with it, that, that's a different thing. So there were laws that govern that, right? Um, I don't know if this falls under civil law or ceremonial law, what I'm thinking of right now. I'll save that for later because I really don't know where to put it. I'll, I'll come back to it. Uh, under civil law, uh, for example, uh, what, about, what about charging interest on loans? No interest. If you loan somebody, yeah, right, right. Why, why did God say no interest? God saw it as taking advantage of your neighbor. They need the money, and you'll loan it with what? Interest. God said, Give. Of course, there were some other things that made that a little more, I guess, palatable, if we could. What happened every 50 years? The year of Jubilee, which means what? All debts were forgiven. Man, I could take some of that right now. I would love to have a year of Jubilee. Anybody know when that's coming up? My luck, I'd die a year before. Right? Yeah, and then I don't have to worry about it, so that's true, that's true, that's true. Yeah, yeah, she'd have to worry about it, so. But, but th it, that governed, uh, let's see, we've talked about this, but let's remind ourselves of it. Uh, here they are in the wilderness, and there's two million of them in all of their livestock and all that. How were they supposed to deal with human waste? Yeah. Exactly. God gave very specifics about how far it had to be out of the camp. God didn't want it in the camp, right? And so you got the tabernacle here, and then you have uh, three tribes facing it this way, and three tribes facing it this way, and three tribes facing it this way, and three tribes facing it this way. Now don't think that that would fit in this room. We got two million people. This is a city, if you will, that's out there. And God says... You have to what? You have to take care of your business outside. And there were two reasons why. The, the one that we normally think of is what? Sanitation, the hygiene of it. But there's a second reason. Why did God say? God says, my glory resides in the midst of the congregation. I'll paraphrase it. And I don't want to step in it. Why? Because I'm glorious. I'm holy. I don't want that around me. It's unclean. Okay? So take it out there. Most of the men during this time, their spears had a little spoon or a shovel on the bottom of it. So they would go out and dig the hole and, and cover it up. Right? But that was a part of the civil law, how you take care of that. Okay? Um, without trying to be embarrassing or whatever, but it, the Bible does talk about it. What about a, a, a woman's monthly cycle? There were very specific commands as it related to that, right? Okay, when we say that every detail of their life was involved, it was. And God did that because they were to be what? Separated from all the other nations. Uh, yeah? Yeah? 
Right, right. Right, yeah, absolutely. Right, exactly. Well, what it does is it identifies the roles and the priorities of that. Now, with, with, that, with that in mind, remember this, that the moral law covered everything. Okay, the moral law covered everything. And so when we hear concepts of like, you know, separation of church and state, the moral law covers that. Right? We don't want a government that sets up a state religion. But we do want a government that abides by moral principle. Right? Yeah, exactly. And, and that was one of the things that our founders, when they came over, uh, and it was such a paramount thing. This is even before Thomas Jefferson, John, John Adams, uh, George Washington. When the pilgrims and the Puritans came over, they were proponents of religious freedom. Right? What was the difference, by the way, between the Puritans and the pilgrims? The, the, the Puritans wanted to purify the church. Pilgrims wanted to be separated from it. They were separatists, okay? You had that battle going on in England. And, and this goes all the way back. For example, we're talking about, you know, when the pilgrims arrived, we're talking about the late 1600s and the early 1700s, right? So they're, they're arriving on the shore, so are, so are the Puritans. But this battle goes all the way back to what? Dates of the Reformation in Europe. For example, uh, probably the better known of all the uh, re reformers was Martin Luther. And this was in the 1500s. Martin Luther was not a separatist. He wanted to purify the church. The separatists didn't want anything to do with the Catholic Church, but the, Pur the, the Puritans wanted to try to, to do it. So when you're having this Protestant Reformation that's occurring, you're going to have some that do what? They break away totally. And I'll say this, there are some that were already broken away. There, there were people who never went into the Catholic Church. Let, let me say this, the Catholic Church wasn't the first church. Sorry. Catholic Church was not the first church. You, are, you have groups of believers who are meeting well before 370 A.D. They're called by a number of names, right? And through history from the Catholic Church, the founding of the Catholic Church, and going from 370 uh, A.D., uh, going toward the Reformation in the 1400s and the 1500s, you have groups of believers who are not associated with it. They, just, they, they, they have different names. They're called uh, the Paulicians. They're called the Donatists. They're called the Monetists. Morovians. Yeah, Morovians were probably some of the most evangelistic and world missionaries that the church has ever seen. Okay, do what now? Yeah, yeah, the Huguenots. And they came from Netherlands. From, yeah, the Dutch, the Netherlands, which is an interesting thing there is because uh, when persecution began on people in England, religious persecution, where did they flee to? They went to the Netherlands where they were given religious freedom, and they experienced that religious freedom, but ultimately would sell boats to the United States. I doubt any of this has been taught in a public school in 50 years. Or longer. But that, that is real history, okay? And, and, and it plays a part in all this. And, and, and uh, there, were, there was a, a group of people who uh, were called repenters, and they also immersed converts. So you have people who were maybe born and raised in the Catholic Church, and so whenever they came to repentance, they've been sprinkled as babies, but they actually came to repentance, if they identified with this group of people, the Catholics called them what? Anabaptist. Because they baptized, they immersed people. They were called Anabaptist. What does Anna mean? No, no, Anna, A-N-A. -A. Anna, Anabaptist. They were re Anna, A-N-A, -A, means re. They were re-baptizers. Anabaptist, okay? And then over time, it got dropped. It's not just, it's not Anabaptist, they became Baptist. 
Okay? And then out of all that, you have all types of other denominations that have come out of it. You have Methodist, you have Presbyterian, you have Lutheran, right? If you've ever been to a Lutheran church, some of the liturgy looks very familiar to a Catholic church. Why? Luther didn't want to separate. He only wanted to purify. Okay? What about the Baptist? You go into a Baptist church, does it look like the Catholic church? No. Why? Because they wanted to separate. Okay? Doesn't make, I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying it's history. I'm not making a value judgment on it. It's just, it's just history, okay? And I believe that God has his people in every one of those. Okay? And there's a lot of people that are in them that aren't God's. It goes both ways. You say, well, can a Catholic be saved? Sure. Can a, can a Baptist be lost? Sure. It's about a relationship with God. Right? It's not about the church. Okay? Man, again, what do you, how do you people do this to me? Okay? All right? So, so then the civil law, okay? Okay? Yeah, yeah. So you got, you, got the, uh, you got the civil law, and now you have the ceremonial law. This detailed and gave explicit set of laws, explicit set of laws, explicit set of laws. It had to be done this way. What if by chance you decided to do it a new way, a fresh way, your way? What happened? What happened to the sons of Aaron? Well, that was from, that was the, uh, the, what was their names? I can't remember now. But yeah, 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 exactly. The sons of Aaron went in and offered strange fire to the Lord. You know what happened? Fire came from heaven and consumed them. God didn't ask them to resign, John Kerry. Shannon's going, don't get that started. Okay. All right, okay. Didn't, didn't, didn't ask him to resign. Didn't, didn't ask him to retire. Didn't give him a second chance. Why? This, this, this law was a picture of Jesus. And people didn't get a, they didn't need a distorted Jesus in type. And so God gave explicit laws of how things were to be done. Everything from put leaven in this and don't put leaven in that. Put honey in that. Don't put honey in that. Burn it this way. Don't burn it that way. The clothes that you wear, you wear this when you do that. You wear this when you do the other. And you better do this before you walk in here because I'll kill you. Because what? This is a picture of my son. And if you can't do it right, don't do it. Right? Now what does that say to the New Testament church? Can we just preach any Jesus we want? No, no, you better not. There's one Jesus, right? Right, right. And, and so uh, it governed their sacrifices, it governed the priesthood, it even said who could be priest. Right? Uh, it, it governed the, uh, the building of the sanctuary, it, it uh, governed their festivals on occasions, it identified sins and uncleanness and what atonement was necessary. It was directed not only to the nation nationally, but individually. And as we said, it, it, it foreshadowed the work and the person of Jesus. That's why it's so important. Now, again, I don't know if this falls under ceremonial law or civil law, but there were certain things that they couldn't eat. Okay? That might fall more under civil law, I guess. But... but Yeah, yeah. God told them, if you'll obey my covenant, you'll not have the diseases of the Egyptians. And if you'll study the diet of the Egyptians and compare it to the diet of Americans, they're very similar. And many of the health issues we have today were the same health issues that the Egyptians had. And God said, if you'll honor what I tell you to do, what? None of these diseases shall be on you, right? And so God told them what to eat, what not to eat, all of that, right? And it covered it. Uh, how about this one? Uh, have you ever wondered why uh, uh, God said don't mix fabrics? Are you familiar with that? In wearing your clothes, God said not to mix fabrics. Do you know why? <laughs> Static electricity, 
Well, you're closer than you realize. You're, you're closer than you realize, right? For example, linen has healing properties. Did you know that? Linen has healing properties within it. The electric magnetic nature of it has healing properties. If you mix it with the wrong fabric and all in a garment, it, it neutralizes its healing effect. You see, God knows more than we know, right? And so he, he's, don't mix that. Don't mix that. I want you to wear that. Don't, don't wear that. Not because it don't look good, but you don't want polyester and linen. They didn't have polyester, but you know what I'm saying, right? Okay? But, but it, ha- it has, a, a number of fabrics have certain, uh, certain healing elements uh, and all. So here are the three categories, moral law, civil law, and ceremonial law. And they were responsible for every one of those, right? And, and it goes back to, for example, uh, civil law and ceremonial law. How often were they supposed to let the land rest? Once they got into the land of Canaan, what, what were they suppo- how, how were they supposed to let the land rest? Every seventh year, let the land rest. And on the what? As you're coming into the year of Jubilee, it rests on the 49th year and it rests on the 50th year. Now, that'd be scary if you are a farmer because if you stop planting and harvesting in the 48th year and you can't plant again until the 51st year, you've got about three years that you're dependent upon good crops. But what did God promise? If you'll do what I tell you to do, I will so bless your crops in the 48th year, you'll have enough to sustain you for the years you don't plant. And guess what? Boys, you get to rest. Not just does the land rest, but what? You get to rest. What a deal. Now, they get to the land, the land of Canaan. Do they do it? No. They don't do it for 490 years. What is the consequences? Babylonian captivity. For every year, you did not let the land rest, 490 years. I'm going to put you into captivity. So for 70 years, they were in Babylonian captivity. Why? Because God wanted the land to rest. Why is that important? Because it's a type of Jesus. Rest. Rest. Take my... Yoke upon you. What's the verse say? You familiar with that? Come unto me. Jesus said that. Come unto me, all ye that labor. Six years I've been laboring. Come come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now here's the great thing about that is, is that as we as we if, if, we were to, if we were to come into our relationship with the last Adam, like the first Adam had his life begin, we would understand that we come into it with rest, not work. I want to make sure I clarify that. Adam was created on the sixth day. What day would that be? You're Friday, but what is it? What's the sixth day in a Hebrew calendar? Yeah, Saturday. Saturday is the sixth day. So he was created on the sixth day, and then his first full day was what? The seventh day that God rested upon. So Adam's first day of life was not a day of work, but a day of rest. You and I come to the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't work for our salvation. We don't work in order to have rest. We rest in Him, and He gives us salvation. You don't work for it. You what? Rest for it. Right? So many types that are, that are in these passages. Now, with, with that being said here, Israel has promise. They have the law. God was very eager to, to help them in this in the sense that he gives the, the, the law 
But along with the don't do this and do this, what else does he do? This goes back to the ceremonial law. What does he do? He's got moral law and civil law, and then he introduces ceremonial law. Why did God introduce ceremonial law? Because they're going to break the moral law and the civil law. But instead of a desire to just let them be in their sin, he provides what? A means of atonement for them. Okay? And so they can, they can atone for their sins. Their sins are covered by the blood, right, and, and, and all of that. Um, what happens to that system, though? We get the idea that even during the days of Jesus, Jews are just constantly bringing sacrifices. Most Jews didn't. Just like if you were to go to Israel today. They're Jews in nationality, but they're not religious. They're secular. Don't have any desire to do it, right? And so the, the purpose of the giving of the Mosaic Covenant, uh, you know this. Let me just uh, give it to you again. Uh, see here let's let's go back a little bit here and see what we got yeah we got time let's go back here let's go all the way to verse three of galatians verse 10 for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse well first of all who's under the law Israel. You've got to keep that in mind here. Israel. For as many as are under the works of the law are under the curse. Well, what is the curse? For it is written, Curse is everyone that continueth not in what? All things which are written in the book of the law to do them. I had an opportunity today to lead uh, BB's friend Nancy to Christ. How old is Nancy, if you don't mind? 69. And so, uh, B.B. and I set up a time to talk with her today after ladies' Bible study and went into the office and, and talked to her. And uh, when we were talking, I asked her the question. I said, do you, do you know for certain that if you were to die? Let me tell you this. She, she asked if I would baptize her is basically how the relationship started. And I told B.B., I said, I'd be glad to do that. I said, but I'd like to talk to her about her relationship with Christ first or we're just going through getting wet. And so uh, I said, but I would like to talk to her. And so she came in. She was very kind and, and, and all. And she, uh, she came in. And I said, I said well, I'd, I'd like to ask you, you know, do you know for certain that if you were to die today that you'd go to heaven? And she said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I am. I am. I'm And she kind of leaned into it a little bit and said, you know, I, I'm a good person. I'm a good person. I mean, I treat people fairly. And, you know, I hadn't been, you know, real mean in my life and all that. And, and she just emphasized, I'm a, I'm a good person. And I said, okay. I said, well, let me ask you a second question. And I said, if you, if you were to stand before God and he were to say, why should I let you into heaven? What, what would you say? And she said, pretty much the same thing. I'm a, I'm a good person. You know, I've not done a lot of really bad things. I mean, I don't go to church and, and all that, but I mean, I've never been a real bad person. And I consider myself fair and good. I said, okay. I said, I, and I said, look, I'm not arguing with you at all. And I said, and, and BB, you'll, you'll verify this. I said, you know, the truth of the matter is you're probably better than me. If, if we were to compare good and bad, you're, you're probably better than me, okay? I said, you don't know me, but BB's known me a long time, and she could bear testimony in my life. There have been some really stupid things that I've done, and I've really disobeyed God. So if we were to compare, you probably are good. Okay, but you don't want to compare yourself to me. Let's just, for example, hear what Jesus has to say. And I said, is that okay? And she said, sure. And I said, well, Jesus said, Matthew 5, 48, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Okay, Nancy, I believe, I really do, that you're a good person. But good is not the standard. Because how good is good enough? You can find somebody that you're worse than, but I bet I could go find somebody that's better than you. So if goodness isn't the standard, but perfection is, I mean, Nancy, what are we going to do with that? Because you and I can't get to heaven 
Because by your own testimony, you're not perfect. What are we going to do? And, and, and boy, the room changed, didn't it? And she, she began to get very contemplative about that. And I'll rush through this very quickly. And I, I just basically told her, I said, well, let me tell you what the cross is all about. For you, I want you to know this. Jesus is God in the flesh. God loved you enough to come and to sin, rather, his son, Jesus, in the flesh, and he, believe it or not, he lived a perfect life. Remember the standard? He lived a perfect life, and then he died on the cross in his perfection. But here's the crazy thing. God put your sin and my sin and the sin of the whole world on his son, and then God judged that. I said, let me illustrate it this way. Imagine you've robbed a bank, Nancy, and there's video and photographs, police testimony, and witnesses, and you go to the judge, and and, and they have the trial, and the judge declares you are guilty. You must go to prison for 20 years. But B.B. is in the courtroom, and she says, Your Honor, and he says, Yes, ma'am, if it's possible, I don't want my 69-year-old friend to go to prison. I know I didn't do it, but could I serve her sentence? And imagine B.B. goes in and serves that sentence, and you go free. That's what Jesus has done for you. He took your sin and gave you his perfection. So now when God looks down, he doesn't see Nancy. He sees the perfection of Jesus, which means when you die, you can come on in. That's the gospel. He says here, for those who do not do all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, they're under a curse. Verse 11, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. How? What's the next phrase? being made a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone that hangs on a tree. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being a curse for us. Now verse 14, in order that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. What was the promise? What was the big promise of the Abrahamic covenant? That all the families of the earth will be blessed. How are they going to be blessed? When the seed... Not a seed, but the seed of Abraham shows up. And the seed is Jesus. And he came to fulfill what was broken in the Mosaic law and to fulfill it so we could get back to the Abrahamic covenant. Because if that wasn't satisfied, then you and I could never get to the Abrahamic covenant because we can't get through the law to get there because we don't have that covenant with God. But God satisfied his wrath, and the law was dealt with. And now what? The invitation comes to experience the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant. Um, Let's see. Down to verse 16. It says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds. To Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Not seeds. Who was the seed again? Jesus. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Now, why does he use the name Christ? Why didn't he say Jesus? Why does he say Christ? Yeah, he was the Messiah. Yeah, he was the promised one. He was the Messiah. Paul says in the book of Romans, Jesus came to confirm the promises made to the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Christ came and died under the law because he's the Messiah of the nation of Israel. He's, he's going to be their Savior, but he's more than that. He is the Savior of the world. 
It's foreshadowed. Go back a little further to uh, Hebrew, uh, Galatians chapter 3. Back to verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the Scripture foreseeing. Not foretelling. Foreseeing, there's a difference. The Scriptures could foresee something. The Scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preach before the gospel unto Abraham. And what is the gospel? Yeah, exactly. And it's available for whom? Anyone who would believe, a Jew or a Gentile, right? And he, and he says, saying, in thee shall all the nations be blessed. That is the gospel. The gospel to Abraham was all the world will be blessed. Well, what does that mean? Well, we don't know until it's revealed later. But all the way back into the days of Abraham, God was shouting through the Abrahamic covenant, I want to bless the whole world. And I'm going to bless you when you come to me by what? Faith, not works. And to prove to you that you can't come by works and you have to come by faith, I'm going to set up this standard and we're going to have a little uh, probationary period with my people that's ultimately going to condemn the Gentiles. And this is the standard. Do this. We can't. Exactly. So trust me. Trust me to do it. I gave you the law and you couldn't do it. And the Gentiles were already in darkness. They were worshiping false gods. They didn't have a god. Their gods were idols, right? They were, they were strangers from the covenants of promise. They were without hope in the world. They did not have God. We're blessed more than we realize. We live in 2021, and we've had basically 2,000 years of the gospel and Christianity. And on top of that, we've been blessed for over 200 years to live in a country where we can hear the gospel. But that's not always been true. Don't take it for granted. There are places on the planet right now that if I were to do this right here, I would either lose my life or be incarcerated. You don't preach the gospel. But we still live in an America where you can preach the gospel. Yeah. And we need to be what? Bold and seize the opportunity. And, and, and I need to seize it, but you don't need to take it for granted. Got about seven minutes. Verse 24 of chapter 3. Actually, I want to go back to verse 22 and start reading uh, Galatians 3 22. But the scripture hath concluded that all are under sin. You want to know about that? Go to Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2. In chapter 3. In Romans chapter 1, Paul says that, the, that the, the wrath of God is being revealed against the Gentiles. How do we know that the wrath of God is being revealed against the Gentiles? Do you know? This was the Roman world. But how would a nation, how would a Gentile nation know that the wrath of God is being revealed against that society? Go to chapter 1. This is big. Romans chapter 1. You want to you know if a society is under the judgment of God? The wrath of God? Romans chapter 1. Go to verse 18. For the wrath of God is being revealed. That's the tense of the verb. It says, is revealed in my scripture uh, in the King James. But it, it, it is this. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, who suppress the truth. The wrath of God is being revealed in a society when that society what? Turns its back on God and as a society begins to do what? Suppress the truth. Well, let's see what that looks like. Verse 19, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it to them. 
For the invisible things of Him from creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. God has revealed His glory and His power through creation. Through creation. Creation is a truth. The heavens declare the glory of God. How do the heavens declare the glory of God? How do the stars tell the glory of God? And by the way, the glory of God is His kindness to people and mercy to people. How do the stars do that? Before the devil got a hold of it, and before the horoscope got a hold of it, the heavens declared the glory of God. How do I know that? Well, look what's up in the heavens. You have a virgin, right? We call that Virgo today, but there's a virgin. There's also what? Leo the lion. Every one of those things tell the gospel. But what have we done? We've suppressed the truth and what? We've replaced it with idolatry. And we declare what? Not that God is sovereign and not that God has the dictate of our lives, but we read a horoscope so the stars can tell me my day. Keep going. Verse 21, Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Step one. Walking away, suppress the truth. Now what? We're suppressing the glory of God in our own lives and, and, and we come up with our own empty thoughts about things. Darwin. Empty thoughts. Vain imagination. Where'd you come from? Not that God in His glory, created you, and how you should be thankful to Him. No, no, no. You put Him aside, and we came up with this thing that we came from monkeys. we got a horoscope to tell us how the monkeys ought to act. Professing, verse 22, professing themselves to be wise. There are men that boast that there is no Creator, that there is no God, and that all of this came through evolution and chance they profess themselves to be wise but they become fools what's happening in america today what is our educational system teaching what have we seen since the early 1900s in america every one of these things and and what is that that's telling me that the wrath of god is being revealed upon the society because the society is what walking further and further away from god maybe you and i aren't but the society is what right uh they profess themselves to be wise they became fools verse 23 they changed the glory of the uncorruptible god into an image made like corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things Here's an example of that, the totem pole. The Indians had the totem pole. They worshiped the great spirit. But what did the totem pole represent? The values they wanted in their tribe. Wise as an owl, sly as a fox, strong as a bear. Did they worship the God of heaven? No, they worshiped the creature. They even named themselves after that. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Verse 24, Wherefore God has given them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Okay, so we have a suppression of the truth. We have of taking God off of His throne as Creator. We remove Him from the picture. We come up with this concept that somehow we've evolved into this. And you are not a mammal. You are not created in the image of God. You are an animal. And you're an animal like all the other animals. You're just an animal. And so why would we put a moral code on an animal? You wouldn't do that to a horse. You wouldn't do that to a cow. You wouldn't do that to a monkey. You wouldn't do it to a zebra. Why why are you going to put a moral code? You can't put your moral code on me. If you haven't talked to a 20-year-old lately, do it. 
And if you begin to bring up biblical truth and biblical standards, they'll say something like this, well, that's okay for you, but you can't, you can't put that on other people. They have a constitutional right to do whatever they want to do. And if that's what the majority wants, wherefore God has given them up to what? Uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause... God gave them up to vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of the error which is what? Fitting. How do we know that a society is experiencing the wrath of God and, and, and how the society doesn't know it? What do you think he's talking about in verses 26, 27? Yes. Women working that which is what? Unseemly with women. It, it is one thing for there to be homosexuality. It is altogether grotesque to another level when women are with women. All of this is born out of evolution. It's born out of feminism. I don't need a man. And we create technologies where you don't need a man. You can buy what you need to impregnate yourself today. You don't need a man. What did the Creator say? Adam and Eve, and my covenant with you is what? Fill the earth. But now what in our society? We are so darkened with vain imaginations that men can be with men and women can be with women and a pervert and a, and a goon can run for governor of California. Listen to me. Bruce Jenner, it, Bruce Jenner is the, the epitome of the, 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 the grotesque nature of sin in America. And we celebrate that. Sports Illustrated Athlete of the Year. Why? Because you're cutting off certain parts of your body and you're growing things in places you shouldn't grow? Now, on one hand, I have compassion because you're lost. And you're going to die and go to hell. I have compassion for that. But on the other hand, I'm angry at the fact that we justify that in our society. And we parade that, and now we got kids wanting to change their gender. And a three-year-old doesn't know the difference between A, B, and C, so how are we going to let him or her change their gender? And what kind of government would allow it? The people who go through all of those changes, do you know the numbers of suicide? And then we have a society that wants to condemn us for it? Well, the reason they commit suicide is they're not accepted. No, the reason they commit suicide is because in their heart of hearts and their souls of souls, they're not in a relationship with God and they've twisted what God has created. I'm telling you, America is already <laughs> under the wrath of God. Okay, next week, we'll pick up with the last part of the Mosaic Covenant. All right, there you go. Let's see how far that goes wide and spread. I hope it goes to the 